chapter 12, and um, we're going to be looking at some of the very well known, you'll see get it when you get there. So when you and I were children, there was a saying we'd often say, I I'm going to say the first half and see if you know it, okay? So cross my heart and? Oh yeah. And now, but you think about that, what does that mean when we're children? What were we actually saying? We were saying we we're making a promise, and if we were to break that, something bad would happen. Now, actually, now if you're squeamish, you ain't gonna like this, because the original phrase is a little longer. Some of you might know it. Cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my <laughs> So the only thing children could think was worse than, than dying was sticking needles in their eyes, okay? And I tend to agree, that's pretty horrible. But here's the thing, children understand the importance of promises. And parents, you soon know quickly, don't you, that you know you need to be very careful the promises you make to your children. Because even if you just say, oh, well, I'll do it tomorrow, and you're just saying it, you know, they'll remember. They'll remember they'll hold you to that. And God understands what promises are about. And he repeatedly told us through the Bible that if he makes a promise, he will keep it. And the Bible calls the most significant kind of these promises, they were called covenants. And a covenant was a kind of promise that God made with Abraham, who was then renamed Abraham. And God promised Abraham that if he left his home and took his family to a place God would show, show them, then God would bless him in several significant ways. Now, there are some people who think rightly that Old Testament covenants are like, are kind of, are like modern day con uh, contracts. And that's kind of true. But covenants in Bible times, they were like contracts on steroids. All right? Because back in the Bible, folks talk about cu cutting a covenant. And if you cut a covenant with someone, you go through an elaborate ceremony. And this is how it would be you'd actually have an animal, like, you know, sheep or goat, and you literally cut it in half. And you put and I know it sounds a bit grim, but this is what they did. You put one half there, one half there, and both parties would walk through the path in the middle. And essentially they were saying, may I be like this dead animal if I ever break this covenant? Serious stuff. Because a covenant, I said, was between these two parties and both of them would walk through. Now, the Lord understood that. And in Genesis 15, it describes how God cut his covenant with Abraham. The Lord said to him, bring me a heifer, a goat and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abraham brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. And with a sun of darkness, a, a sun of set, darkness of falling, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch, representing God, appeared and passed between the pieces. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. Why is that significant? Because God understands what they were doing, understands what men were doing to make an agreement, and God wanted to be part of that. I think I've said here before, when we, when we read about the Ten Commandments, it wasn't one to five and six to ten. They were two tablets with the same thing on them. One for God, one for man. And they were put in the ark. Because it was a binding covenant, covenant between two parties. So in the same way, God was saying, a bit like you know, that, that child is singing across my heart, he was making that promise. Now, in other words, it was a serious vow. God takes his promises seriously. And this is important for us for two reasons. Firstly, whenever God makes a promise, he intends to keep it. It was a dramatic way of God driving home that he was committed to fulfilling what he said. In other words, God says, if, if I say it, I will do it. In 2 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 20, Paul tells us, no matter how, prom how many promises God has made, they, yeah, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen 
is spoken to us, so spoken by us to the glory of God. And the promises here in Genesis 12 were exciting to Abraham and should be exciting to us because Abraham was a man who wasn't all that different from us. Now, just think about it. Here he is. He, by this point, he's 75 years old. And scripture says little about anything he'd done during those years. We don't know much, hardly anything, about what Abraham had been doing before this time. So suddenly this 75-year-old man, appears in scripture, was he a great warrior? No. Great theologian? No. Not much of a writer? Well, there are no, no Bible books written by him. And yet Abraham's regarded as one of the greatest men in the Old Testament. Only Jesus and maybe Moses are more highly regarded in Scripture. So what did Abraham do to be so worthy of such importance? Well, the answer is right here in verse 1 of Genesis 12. The Lord said to Abraham, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. That's it. God asked him to pack up his tent and go to a place where he'd never been. And so Abraham packed up his tent, put his wife on the camel, and off they go. And yet Hebrews 11, verse 8 to 10, tells us that by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So God said move, and Abraham moved. That is it. It really is that simple. And you might think, well, that doesn't sound particularly impressive. I've moved lots of times. And yet God sets Abraham to be one of the major, you know, major people, major men in scripture because he moved. So what was so impressive about that? Well, I think one of the clues is this, that Abraham was a man who believed in the one true God. In other words, he was on his own. Here at church, it's easy, I've said before, I'm a brilliant Christian every Sunday morning because I'm surrounded by all my brothers and sisters. Abraham, the Jewish historian Josephus, claimed that Abraham became the first person to argue that there's a single God who is the creator of all things. So when everyone else was worshipping all kinds of things, Abraham believed in the one true God. And I think that's quite a hard thing to do when no one else believes that. No one else knows that God. So he trusted God. He had faith. Romans 4 verse 9 tells us that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Now that should excite us. And the reason is because it means that we don't have to be important in this world for God to want to use us. We don't have to have an impressive resume for God to want to work in our lives. We don't have to be strong or smart or rich or powerful. All we have to do is trust God, believe in God, have faith in God. All God wants to know is this. Do you trust him enough to let him work in your life? Will you let him lead you where he wants you to go? Will you let him remake you and rework you so that he can use you. Something I heard when I was very young was the difference between knowing Jesus is your Savior and Jesus is your Lord. The person speaking to me said, You know Jesus is your Lord when Jesus says, Go this way, you want to go that way, but you follow him. It doesn't matter what strengths you think you have. It doesn't matter how skilled or clever or rich or powerful you are. Those things don't impress God. God isn't looking at your resume. He's looking at whether or not he can trust you to do what he wants done. I've spoken about this before about what it means to be a yes person. You know, if someone calls me wanting help, 
Do I say, yes, what, I, what can I do? Or do I say, what is it? Then I'll make my mind up. What kind of person are you? And, you know, it challenges me that. Hopefully it challenges you. All God wants to know is, if he asks you to do something, will you do it? Last week, I, I was actually in a meeting with uh, some of the church leaders. They were talking about finding volunteers for a church event at Easter. And uh, I actually popped out to the loo. When I came back, the senior pastor of the church just said, oh, Darren, I've just um, said that you'd be okay to find some volunteers from, from our church for this event. And I just said, okay, Paul, that's fine. And I sat down. But some of the other leaders, they kind of, I don't know, they, they kind of joked about me being well-trained and was mocking, <laughs> mocking my compliance. Whereas from my perspective, I've been asked to do something, so I'll do it. It wasn't complicated. I didn't need to ask 48 questions. Will you do this, Darren? Yes, I will. And sometimes when it comes to God, we, we come with more questions than we need to. Sometimes God just wants our yes, first and foremost. Because you see, the first thing that God's coming with Abraham should teach us is that if God makes a promise, we can trust him to keep it. Faith is when we trust God to do exactly what he said. Uh, Romans 4, verse 21. This is fantastic. It says, Abraham was fully persuaded that God had power to do what he promised. That is why it was credited to him as righteousness. And you're getting an insight there into Abraham's heart, aren't you there? Beyond just his physical actions, as he goes physically, God's doing something in him spiritually. I often talk about and the Holy Spirit is prompting someone to maybe stand or to receive or anything like that. Sometimes in the action of standing or the action of coming to the front for prayer, as you do that, the Holy Spirit is already working in you before someone even prays for you or talks to you because you're already moving forward in faith. Abraham believed that God had the power to do what he promised. The second thing we can learn from the promise in Genesis 12 is this, that the covenant with Abraham is the covenant of the Bible. All other promises in scripture seem to hinge upon this guarantee that God made to him. For example, what did he promise him? Uh, 12 verse 3, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. That's in the New King James. God was telling Abraham, I will take care of you. People will curse you and people will bless you, but I've got your back. The good news is the promise wasn't exclusive to Abraham. We're all inheritors of that same promise. God will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. You and I have the same promise because this is the promise God made to all through Abraham. Same promise, same God. And God makes his promise to us because we, like Abraham, are now covenant people. We are people God made his promises to. Why? What makes us so special? That God will make us promises like those he made to Abraham. Well, there's one reason. It's for Jesus. It's only by the blood of Jesus that we have any promises from God. And this goes to the heart of what I want to say this morning. The promises made to Abraham in Genesis pointed ultimately to Christ. That's why Paul wrote in Galatians 3 verse 16, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. Abraham was chosen by God to be the beginning of a long line of descendants that ultimately led to Jesus. Matthew 1 starts down, doesn't it? A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, and so on. So God began Christ's genealogy in Matthew with Abraham. And the, one of the reasons he could do this so he could set up like a paper trial for Christ. 
to do with his ancestry. Now you might think, why is that important? Well, let's have a think about history going back around about 500 years or so before Jesus. A man, I've got to get his name right, Siddhartha was born. And we know him better as Buddha. And centuries before Buddha was born, no one was saying someone like Buddha is coming. No one prophesied that a man called Buddha would live and teach and die as he did. No one said these will be his parents or grandparents. Buddha just popped in history, taught the things he taught, and he became the founder of one of the world's great religions. About 500 years or so after Jesus came a man called Muhammad. He was born, and centuries before Muhammad was born, nobody ever said someone like Muhammad is coming. No one ever prophesied that a man like Muhammad would live and teach and die as he did. And no one ever said these will be his parents or his grandparents or great grandparents. He just popped into history, taught the things he did, became the founder of one of the world's religions. By contrast, when Jesus was born, there had already been centuries of prophecy about how he would live and teach and die and rise from the dead. And Abraham became the linchpin of a long line of descendants that ultimately led to Christ. And it amazes me when you look in Hebrews uh, 11 and 12, you have this sense of these people having a longing inside them that there was something more, that they were part of a bigger picture. Part of a bigger picture that started right back at the beginning in the garden. When God's heart was broken as Adam and Eve were leaving that garden. And I'm paraphrasing here, but God's words as they were leaving that garden was, I'm coming back for you. I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to put my plan into place. Now, just one more thing. The promise given to Abraham didn't just point to the coming of Jesus. God's promise didn't point to the foundation of what Jesus came to do. Because God kicks off Christ's genealogy with, ge genealogy with Abraham. And God picks up a man born about 300 years after Noah dies. Why? Because Abraham did nothing to deserve God's promises. Abraham wasn't chosen because he was a great writer or a great soldier or a prominent theologian or a powerful leader. There was only one reason God chose Abraham. Abraham's faith was credited to his righteousness. He was chosen because he was willing to trust God. And it was his willingness to believe God's promises that made him impressive to God. God made Abraham the central focus of his promises because he wanted us to realize that centuries later, Jesus would not only save us because, sorry, Jesus would not save us because of who we were, or what we've done. He would only save us because of what we believed. And that's why when someone comes to, comes to Christ, the past is forgotten. It doesn't matter. It's about what's in our hearts and coming to him. Jesus did not come to save the righteous, but the lost. I say hallelujah to that, because None of us are righteous are we? in our own eyes. He came to heal the sick, not the ones who thought they were well. Romans 4.13, it was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but, through, but by the righteousness that comes through faith. Too many people get the impression that God will be impressed with them. They believe God will accept them because they're pretty nice people. Or they go the other way. Some people spend their lives trying to pay God back for what he's done. They can never do that. They can never do that. God was going to save us, not because of righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy. So in Titus uh, chapter 3, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit 
who he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. The only way you or I will ever make it to heaven will be by the promise and blood of Christ. We stand only by the promise of salvation through Jesus. Or to put it even simpler, we're only here because of him. Centuries ago, thousands of Jews stood outside the temple courts and heard a man called Peter confront them about their sins. His sermon was so convincing that they asked, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptised every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Let's stand together, shall we? Yeah. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a Lord, a God who keeps his promises. And that we can trust in the promises that you give us because of Jesus. Thank you that Jesus came to fulfill the law. Thank you that none of us stand in our own righteousness. We're only here because of you. Because of who you are. Because of what you've done. I pray this morning that we catch a fresh revelation of that, of who we are in Christ, of what he's done in us and through us. And Lord, that we would be those who are obedient to your call. That when you say go, we will go. Forgive us when we give you more questions and answers. Forgive us for when we wonder why things are happening when all you want us to say is, yes, Lord, I trust you. Just in the quiet now, I'm just going to give you, on your own, time just to do some business with God. And if you know that you've been that person who's been asking more questions and answers, just in your heart, you might need to repent of that and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I want to be a person who says yes to you. Mm -hmm. I want to come to that point where I realize that you know better than I do. Whatever my circumstance, you know better than I. So I'm just going to give all of us a chance now to come humbly before our God. Let's just do that now as we're quiet. Holy Father, I recognise it's easy to trust you when we're here on a Sunday morning. It's a lot harder during the week when things happen, things go wrong for us, we wonder what's going on. It's a lot harder to trust you when circumstances seem against us. But first and foremost, Lord, I pray, I pray that we be those who indeed say yes to you. And we trust that you always know better than we do. That you have a plan for our lives. Amen. Bless you guys. <laughs>